We now move to questions of the Minister of Justice and we'll start once again with oral questions and I call Barry McElduff. Mr McElduff. Question number one. Mr Speaker, significant progress has been made on the development of the legal aid forecasting model. A new methodology has been developed which pays particular attention to identifying and incorporating those factors which have the, the potential to impact on legal aid expenditure. Arrangements are in place to obtain information from other organisations which could impact on the demand for legal aid. Measures are also being put in place to quality assure and test assumptions on a regular basis. The new methodology will now be tested robustly to ensure that it is fit for purpose. It is planned to roll out the model in phases from this month and it will continue to be refined to improve its accuracy and reliability. Question number two and question number eight has been withdrawn. Barry McElduff. Mr McElduff. Uh, uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer and can I ask the Minister further, how will links with other parts of the justice system improve forecasting? Well, I believe, Mr Speaker, the simple question is that there are elements uh, of legal aid forecasting which has been difficult in the past. For example, uh, the assignment of an additional Crown Court judge uh, has in ensured that uh, some criminal cases went through faster than others would have done. There are also other points where we can look at uh, work which is happening elsewhere in the system, seek to see what the impact, for example, of new legislation of other provisions are, so that we ensure we get better forecasting in the future. But of course, the key issue is the fact that spending is significantly in, still in excess of budget, and that has to be addressed. Call me, Stuart. I thank the, the Minister for his answers. Um, given that the Criminal Justice Inspectorate described the, the Legal Services Commission as not fit for purpose. Is the Minister confident that this new agency uh, will be? Well, Mr Speaker, I certainly believe that by bringing the Legal Services Commission uh, in as legal service agency, provided, of course, that the Assembly consents to the bill being introduced tomorrow, uh, or second stage tomorrow, uh, gives us the potential to get uh, a greater handle on the work being done and to ensure that we bring closer together the issues of criminal and civil legal aid in a way which ensures departmental officials are fully aware of how progress is being made. Danny Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers so far. But what assessment has been made of the impact on family law if significant reductions are made in the legal aid budget? Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Kenhan raises a very significant point. The reality is we are not in the same place as is currently happening in England and Wales, which has attracted so much comment in the press, and indeed which has seen the Lord Chancellor remove some of his proposals for changes. We are still in the position that we have not reduced the scope of legal aid in any respect in Northern Ireland. We have certainly cut, cut the fees paid to lawyers, but we have ensured that those who received legal aid continue to receive legal aid. What we have to do in, as we go forward and look at a further review of access to justice is to ensure that that remains the case, that whether through conventional legal aid or through other methods, those who are in most need continue to receive that support. Lord Morrow. Mr Morrow. Speaker, um, Minister, surely it's time to consider a levy on all legally aided uh, cases proportionate to uh, income and assets. What consideration have you given to taking this particular step? Well, I think, Mr. Speaker, we need to be careful about talking about a levy on any legal aid. The purpose of legal aid is to assist those who cannot afford legal representation for themselves. We have certainly looked at the issue where, um, on occasions, legal aid has been granted and it appears uh, that individuals had assets greater than might have been declared in the first instance, and there have been a few cases where that has been followed up recently. But I would be extraordinarily careful of suggesting that we should levy uh, some sort of charge on all recipients of legal aid. Hello. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Minister's efforts uh, to improve forecasting in legal aid expenditure. But obviously, uh, improving the system in itself is not going to bring in additional money. Can I ask, and, and also, uh, budgets obviously are going to increase year by year. year um, can I ask the Minister, um, will he be continuing to develop measures to further reduce public expenditure on legal aid? while protecting access to justice for the most vulnerable in our society. Well, yes, Mr. Speaker, I can confirm that. I, I referred uh, briefly uh, earlier to the issue of a further review of access to justice. 
it is certainly my intention that we should build on the reforms which are already underway uh, with a further more targeted uh, review of those aspects of access to justice which were not fully covered in the review which took place shortly after devolution of justice. What is important is that we continue to make those reforms, continuing to provide the full uh, opportunities for legal aid to be accessed when necessary, but we do have a considerable issue which resulted in having to grant £31 million in the financial year just ended to ensure that we could meet the cost of legal aid. And clearly that position is unsustainable at the present time. We need to ensure we do things better. Rodwin McGahan. Gourmet, I get to question three. Mr Speaker, the projected savings over the next 12 months as a result of the removal of the provisions in relation to very high cost cases from relevant legal aid rules is £13.6 million. Can the Minister give an assurance that there will be no reduction in access to justice as a result of these cuts? Perhaps, Mr Speaker, we should have grouped the, the first question in this one. Uh, what I can give an assurance is that we, as we seek to review, we're ensuring, for example, that uh, where we maintain access to justice, unless it's um, alternative ways in which we've provided, for example, as we look at money damage places, we will continue to ensure that access to justice is available across the whole spectrum of issues. But it remains the case, particularly on criminal legal aid, that conventional legal aid remains extremely expensive. Uh, members will have seen recent changes which were proposed and dropped in England and Wales, but the reality is we are still more expensive than England and Wales, even though they claim that they're the most expensive system in the world. Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And I, I would ask the Minister, can he detail uh, why for so many years there were such a significant number of very high cost cases? Mr. Speaker, I'm fond of standing up in this chamber and saying, don't blame me for what went on pre devolution. But on this occasion, Mr. Speaker, don't blame me for what went on pre devolution. What I have done since devolution is get a handle on things. I understand in England and Wales there was something like 5% of cases went through as very high cost cases. Prior to devolution, it was something like 55% in Northern Ireland. That was because of decisions to grant VHCC status to cases far in excess of what would have been reasonable in other jurisdictions. I'm pleased to see that the first batch of reforms we put through have brought an end to that. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, the Minister talks about a savings of $13.6 million uh, in relation to very high cost cases. Are there additional savings uh, in relation to criminal legal aid and other aspects of civil legal aid uh, included in that? Or, 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 sorry, sorry, Mr. Speaker, maybe I'll repeat that then. <laughs> uh, would the Minister can, uh, uh, the Minister has given a figure of £13.6 million as a saving. Uh, would the Minister indicate whether, there, whether or not there are other savings in addition to that in relation to ordinary criminal uh, legal aid and indeed civil uh, uh, legal aid? Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank Mr. McGuinness for repeating the question to make sure I got it exactly right. I have announced savings have already been delivered of £20 million in criminal legal aid of which 13.6 million came from very high cost cases. Uh, the remainder was a general reduction in costs. Uh, there are current further proposals uh, for changes to civil legal aid, which are estimated to produce annual savings of around 18 million pounds, and further changes in Crown Court fees for criminal work, uh, which are estimated to produce five and a half million pounds saving. Those are issues which are, of course, currently in some cases with the Justice Committee at this time. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Question number four, Mr. Speaker, please. Mr. Speaker, in August 2013, my department engaged with environmental health officers from Belfast City Council to explore how the general product safety regulations of 2005 could be effectively used to tackle the issue of new psychoactive substances. These discussions led to a joint operation in November 2013 between the PSNI and EHOs, resulting in raids on five commercial premises selling these substances. The resulting court case concluded with the forfeiture order being applied and the removal of these harmful substances from sale to the general public. I understand that the Belfast EHOs have kept their colleagues in other councils advised of their approach, and I welcome this sharing of information and joined up working. 
My department remains committed to working in partnership to respond effectively to the issue. Thank the Minister for his answer. And, uh, I think we should all congratulate Belfast City Council on their recent actions to tackle this problem. Does the Minister recognise that these, such drugs are being sold, that they are often not properly labelled and do not have any safety uh, information? They obviously, they have inadequate safety information. So those that are, that are using them are very much put at risk, which obviously includes young people and others who are the most vulnerable in our society. Well, yes, Mr Speaker, I certainly understand the whole point is that these substances are not properly tested, not properly labelled, and that's why the general product safety regulations was an appropriate way under existing law to take action. Clearly, as the Home Office carries out the review of this matter, which is not a devolved matter, we will see what implications there are for us in the future. Raymond McCartney. Mr McCartney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer to date, and indeed, can I also commend him on the approach taken, uh, which the Department obviously assisted Belfast City Council and then the, the, the work of the PSNA. I'm just wondering if, if, the, if the Minister is considering, on behalf of the Department, uh, a coordinate the collective right across the, all the Council areas, so they can have a, an approach rather than perhaps just whatever contact they have with one another, that all the Councils together collectively go at this and use the same regulation to ensure that all these type of head shops are confronted in the way that they should be. Well, I appreciate the point Mr. McCartney is making, Mr. Speaker, though I do think to some extent that is what's already been done. I mean, the, it's been a matter more of coordination between the different EHOs from the 26 councils rather than something that the department has been directly involved in with each of them, although there were, you know, a joint workshop you know, was held which involved staff from my department alongside others. I understand that you know, there have been further meetings subsequently held between council staff, and I understand that there is now potentially a further prosecution pending. Uh, in another council area, so it seems that that joining up is being done at council level, but the department is willing to help if we can help in any respect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the legislative approach taken in, in the South to the issue of legal highs and, and head shops. And I understand he's written to colleagues uh, uh, saying that uh, he is awaiting advice from London, but would the Minister agree that in the absence of a comprehensive legislative approach here, then the good work done on the rest of this island will be undermined. Well, I need to be careful, Mr. Speaker, because as I said, this is not a devolved matter. Um, I do think what we've shown is that we've been able to act under the existing law as it applies in terms of product safety. Um, and I understand that the Home Office review is also considering what has happened in the Republic to see what lessons there are in terms of placing the burden of proof on the provider that something is safe as opposed to the, uh, the prosecuting authorities having to be required to prove it's unsafe. So I think that is something which we, we do need to await the outcome, but in the meantime it's very pleasant that we've been able to see prosecutions by the Environmental Health Department. Leslie Creed. Question 5, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, to date no individuals have been appointed to the role of custody prison officer for the most recent recruitment competition. The prison service's priority has been to appoint to the grade of prisoner custody officer from this competition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I thank the Minister for his response. But, Minister, can you tell us uh, how many likely posts are going to be needed to fill the quota and when will the next recruitment exercise be? Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't say exactly how many posts may be required in uh, the immediate future. The answer uh, is that we, uh, we have seen uh, a list compiled which, in, the, in the keeping with the normal public sector, is applicable for a year. Uh, so that, that will therefore potentially apply for a full year. The issue as to how many further custody officers we may need depends to a certain extent on resignation rates. Um, we know that. Uh, of those who were the 309 who were appointed in the 2012 competition, I believe 34 have left the prison service to date, and there will be issues of replacing them, but there are also other staff who have been regraded, and it is not possible to give a specific figure at this stage. Paul Gibbon. Mr. Speaker, and uh, the Minister will know that at McGabry now in the region of 50 per cent of all staff are, are new recruits. Uh, what undertaking can he give to this House uh, that he will uh, assess 
uh, if custody officers are being appropriately moved up the pay scale, as some representation is being made, that that isn't uh, the case. Related to it as well, can the Minister confirm how many officers of the voluntary exit scheme still remain uh, to be released? Well, to answer, to answer the second point first, Mr Speaker, um, by uh, the good management of department funding towards the end of the year, uh, I believe it was then possible to release 16 of the 28 remaining officers who had sought the voluntary early retirement scheme, leaving 12 further. Unfortunately, um, despite some hope that we might have received additional funding from DFP towards the latter end of the year, that was not received. Uh, as far as the opportunities go uh, for the promotion from custody officers, it is certainly the case that progress was not made as swiftly as we had hoped uh, to see people moving up the scale, in part because of the issue of the voluntary early retirement scheme not being implemented fully. But I believe we have now got arrangements in place to ensure that we get proper accredi accreditation of the work being done by custody officers, which will make it easier to get the promotion prospects coming through. Rosalind McCurley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers up to now. Can I ask the Minister if he can outline the impact of new staff and how that contributes to the um, creation of a much-needed uh, new culture among prison staff? Well, I certainly uh, see, as I go around the prisons, Mr. Speaker, a very significant change in culture. A recognition that a minority of prisoners, especially in McGavery, require to be held in top security conditions, but the great majority do not require that. And there has been a significant change in the way that prisoners are managed, in the responsibilities devolved to staff, and in the opportunities, for example, of freer movement around the prisons. Uh, how much of that is attributable to new recruits, and how much to good lessons uh, being applied by management? and by existing staff, I don't know. I do know, for example, when I visited the Families Matter wing in Coyle House in McGabry, uh, I spoke to three officers who were involved in running that, none of whom were new, one of whom told me he had 30 years service in the prison service and who felt that the opportunity he was having to reform prisoners by better family engagement was the first time he'd really had the opportunity to do the work he wanted to do. So, yes, let's welcome the culture, but let's recognise the work being done by long-serving staff as well as by new recruits. Jim Wells. Mr Wells. Question number six, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, proposals to consider the introduction of a civil penalty for the non-payment of the TV licence would have a modest but welcome impact on the number of people committed to prison. In 2012, there were 155 committals to prison for the non-payment of fines imposed because of the non-payment of TV licences. Each committal was for a few days. I welcome the proposal to decriminalise non-payment of TV licences, which I have been advocating for two years and have written to the Minister for Culture, Media and Sport in Westminster on a number of occasions to press it. It is good to see that the UK Government is finally catching up with a proposal that we in Northern Ireland made two years ago. Yeah. I assume that the legislation covering England, Scotland and Wales would be extended to Northern Ireland without the need of a legislative consent motion. That being the case, how much does he believe that this change would save the prison service in Northern Ireland? Well, indeed, Mr. Speaker, it is non-devolved legislation, which is why I had to write to DCMS about it. Um, the cost, clearly, of maintaining 155 prisoners for a few days is not a very significant cost. The administrative burden on uh, admitting and then discharging 155 individuals uh, is rather more than is needed. And certainly in line with the general work that the department is doing on fines and enforcement to find a better way of ensuring those sentenced to fines either pay the fines or carry out some form of community service. Uh, that's the way in which we will re you know, resolve the entire issue about non-payment of fines in general and not just TV licenses. But I do think it's very welcome that we're now addressing TV licenses in, in a way which will ensure that they can be better managed as a civil issue. Sean Rogers. Mr. Thank, Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, what progress has been made in dealing with the current fine defaulters? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, Mr. Rogers asked a question which could go on for a considerable period of time. Uh, there certainly has been a significant improvement recently in terms of uh, matters dealing with remedying the backlog 
although in many cases now, in fact the vast majority of cases, uh, cases now have to go to court to be determined what further penalty may be appropriate. Um, in terms of the longer term issue, that's where the fines and enforcement bill, which I hope to introduce to the Assembly in the autumn of this year, will provide for a better way of dealing with it by the provision of a civilianised collections and fine enforcement service with a range of options like deductions from pay, deductions from benefit, uh, potentially even the forfeiture of motor vehicles. All of those are opportunities which will take away from the difficulty of enforcing fines and having only prison as a last resort. Judith Cochran. Uh, Mrs. Cochran. Question number seven, please. The amendment to the Public Service Pension Bill provides only for those RUC widows within the Royal Ulster Constabulary Pension Regulations of 1988. I believe that all RUC widows should be treated equally. I have asked my officials to take forward steps to explore how this provision might be extended to RUC widows within pre-1988 police pension schemes. I have written to the Minister of Finance and Personnel and also to the Justice Committee about the practicalities of delivering this change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister um, for his commitment to ensure the continuation of pension provision extends to all RUC widows and not just those in the 1988 scheme. And whilst I know that it's not possible to backdate, backdate the payments, is it the Minister's intention now to properly fix what the amendment didn't quite do and ensure payments for pre-1988 schemes will also take effect from July 2014? Yes, Mr. Speaker, that is certainly my intention. Um, as Mrs. Cochrane highlights, it is not possible to backdate, but it is certainly my intention that the effective date of all the police pension schemes, because there are actually two schemes pre-1988 which may uh, have relevance, it is my intention to ensure that the effective date of all of them is in line with the measure passed by this Assembly uh, the 1st of July of this year. It may not be possible to get all the necessary regulations through by the 1st of July, but they will be backdated to an effective date of the 1st of July. Ian McRae. Mr. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, can I welcome the, the Minister's um, response? Um, having already raised this with the Finance Minister, um, I just want to assure the Minister that this party will be supporting it. Has the Minister, or can the Minister advise, uh, when he intends to discuss this with the Minister of, of Finance? Well, I don't have a specific date to discuss it with the Minister, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for Mr. McRae's benefit and others, it is an issue which is already under discussion by my officials in significant detail to see exactly how the measure can be implemented. Uh, the reality is this is something which has been looked at almost since the point of devolution because of the discriminatory nature of the regulations. Uh, what we established by the legislative change was that we could deal uh, with this matter in a different way, which did not have repercussions elsewhere. And I am now pleased to have the opportunity to carry it forward to ensure that all RUC widows are treated fairly. Jim Allister, Mr. Allister. Um, I note what the Minister says. I must say the advice uh, proffered to me by the Bills Office and others was that since the 1988 regulations subsumed all earlier regulations that rescinding the offending portion of the 1988 regulations had the effect of bringing the same benefit to all widows, all police widows, and I understand that is also the DFP view. So why has the minister, or where has the minister obtained the view that he is expounding today it certainly doesn't seem to be in accordance with the advice tendered by those who drafted the bill and by the Department of Finance. Well, I can only answer, Mr. Speaker, that that is the advice I am given within the Department of Justice, that the issue is not fully addressed by the legislation which this House has already passed. And on that basis, I believe it's important that we should ensure that there is no gap, no misunderstanding and that we should ensure that we close any gaps there are as soon as possible after the 1st of July. Clark. Mr. Clark. Question number nine. Mr. Speaker, with permission, I'll take questions 9 and 13 together. The figures provided by HMRC, and which have been widely covered in the media and elsewhere, relate to tax affairs in a civil recovery investigation. I am advised by HMRC that Section 18 of the Commissioners of Revenue and Customs Act 2005 has a taxpayer confidentiality clause which makes it an offence to divulge details of anyone in relation to such an investigation. 
HMRC cannot, therefore, identify those believed to be evading tax in respective fuel cases or give information which might lead to their identification. While this is principally a revenue matter, I have written to the Economic Secretary to the Treasury asking her to consider whether the legislation needs to be reviewed and whether appropriate steps are being taken, are being taken by HMRC against offending stations. I have also asked for the issue to be considered at the next meeting of the Organised Crime Task Force subgroup on fuel. Finally, I should note that there is an error in the widely quoted figure of 467 stations in Northern Ireland selling illicit fuel across a four-year period. This figure applied across the United Kingdom as a whole. The Northern Ireland figure is 249 offences detected across four years, ending with 2012-13, and applies only to registered retail sites. The figure may include stations which have been found to be in breach more than once. While the figures are not held in an easily analysed format, I asked HMRC to indicate the actual number of retail sites where it has found illicit fuel. HMRC has confirmed that in 2013-14, illicit fuel that is laundered, mixed or smuggled was identified at 33 individual filling stations in Northern Ireland. Can I, can I thank the Minister for, for that answer? And I mean, I, I accept the clarification in terms of the number of stations. However, that doesn't diminish the fact that many of us and, and the members of the public on a daily basis are going into filling stations which are evading uh, the taxes that are due. And in the Minister's response, she did say there there's 200 and something uh, registered filling stations. But we're all very familiar as elected representatives of those filling stations that are currently aren't registered and we can only assume that they're selling illicit fuel. So what is your department, along with the planning service, going to do to bring this to an end in Northern Ireland? Well, I repeat the, the point again. We were not talking about 249 filling stations, though that's the way it was announced, but 249 offences. We don't know how many multiple cases there were. Mr. Clark correctly highlights the issue um, of whether they were registered or non-registered, but the reality is, as I repeat the point, this is a non-devolved issue for HMRC. That is why I've written to the Treasury uh, to ask for action to be taken at that level. Thomas McCallum's not in his place. Lord Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Question number 10, please. Mr. Speaker, processing times for adult charge cases in the magistrates' courts have improved year on year over the last three years. These cases take on average 80 days to complete. Youth court charge cases have remained stable over the same period. Average processing time is now 118 days. Summons cases in both the adult magistrates and youth courts have improved by around 15% over the last three years. However, I'm clear that summons cases still take too long. Processing times for the Crown Court have also improved. These improvements are the result of changes delivered by the criminal justice agencies, including the introduction of streamlined files for low-level criminal cases, police gatekeepers to provide pre-charge advice to investigating officers, and shortened pre-sentence reports for appropriate cases. More recently, reforms such as the youth engagement clinics aimed at freeing up capacity in the youth court for more serious offences, as well as measures to improve processing times for forensic tests have been implemented but it is clear that legislative reform is required to deliver the faster, fairer justice system that we require, and we all have a role in delivering that. I will be writing to executive colleagues shortly to secure approval to introduce a draft justice bill which will contain a number of fundamental long-term reforms to improve the justice system. The bill represents an ambitious blueprint for transforming our justice system in order to deliver faster, fairer justice. Lord Morrow. I thank the Minister for his reply. And he has said in his reply that some cases take too long, and I would think that that was a mild and kind way to put it. it uh, there are many who feel that it takes um, just a bit more than too long, that the, the time that it's taken to get these cases through is excessive. Can the minister do anything in the meantime to ensure that there's not this image around the whole court system, whereas it's taken just too long uh, to have cases heard? and that there seems to be a, a, a logjam in the court system. What can he or his department do in the meantime uh, to uh, change all of that? Well, Mr Speaker, I did indicate uh, that there has been significant improvement in a number of areas. The key area where more work is required is in the youth court. That's why there's been a particular focus on that, uh, why we have instituted the pilot of a youth engagement clinic in Belfast, and why we're looking at how that pilot, the lessons from that pilot can be carried forward to ensure that we speed up the process generally. 
There is no doubt that the pilot has succeeded in removing some of the less serious cases from the full work of the justice system, which has enabled greater concentration on those cases which do require court appearances. And I've no doubt that the, uh, those clinics are making a difference. I've also no doubt that as we look, for example, at the fixed penalty notices, which were introduced for a number of minor offences under the First Justice Act of this Assembly, that that's also helped remove a number of cases from the adult court as well. But there is no silver, silver bullet which is going to deal with these issues. It's requiring a lot of work across a number of agencies, work which is, we're seeing some delivery from, but clearly there is rather more still to be done. More questions to the Minister. We now move to topical questions to the Minister, and I call David Hillage. Mr Hillage. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And will the Minister uh, join with me in condemning the dastardly, despicable and evil attack on PSNN Carrick Fergus last night, where a uh, police officer was injured and taken to accident emergency, and indeed police property, a vehicle, was damaged as well, and another officer stranded that a armoured car had to actually retrieve him from the site. This is largely gone unreported in the media. Has the Minister spoken with the, the Chief Constable about the situation currently in South East London? Mr Speaker, I have not spoken to the Chief Constable today uh, about the particular incident discussed. Um, I will be meeting the Chief Constable later in the week on the wider issues of public order and, in particular, uh, the apparent involvement of certain paramilitary groups will, I am sure, feature in that particular discussion. David Hillage. Thank you, and I th thank the Minister for that. Will he ensure at that meeting, when it takes place, that he appeals for all resources and uses good offices to appeal for all resources that are needed to, to, to be given to East Antrim and South East Antrim to sort this matter out? Well, Mr Speaker, uh, tempted though I would be to agree with that particular point, um, especially when he used the word South in the context of Antrim, um, I can say what I like as a constituency member. As Minister, I will say the deployment of resources I will leave to the Chief Constable. Sean Lynch. Peter Lynch. I agree with the uh, call you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, it was announced last week that the Desecrate College would be put on hold, but the preferred bidder wouldn't be able to deliver the project within the budget. What assurances can the Minister give that the project will not stall as a result? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, th I think I need to slightly correct Mr. Lynch. He certainly identifies the fact that there is a problem. To say that Desert Creek College has been put on hold is not accurate. What is clearly happening is that the preferred bidder is not in a position to proceed uh, within uh, the financial limit, which was agreed there, uh, even after the exercise to reduce some costs from the scheme. Um, as a result, the Programme Board has commissioned work to look a, at a significant change to reduce costs without reducing the functionality of the college. That work will take a number of weeks to do. It will then take it away from the single preferred bidder to the point that the five uh, consortia which were on the select list will get the opportunity to re-tender again. Given that much of it will be work for which they've already set up costs, uh, it should hopefully be, uh, be completed more speedily than would be the case if it was a completely new scheme. But certainly the Department of Justice and its agencies remain, remain completely committed to ensuring that the college goes ahead at Desert Creek. Sean Lynch. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister, when the preferred bidder was announced last December, it was expected that work would begin this year sometime and that the uh, time frame was something like um, 27 months to complete. Is this time frame still realistic? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I have to agree with Mr. Lynch. It's, it's not, unfortunately, now realistic. But I do believe in terms of the work which is being done, which has been done very speedily to look at the precise specification that's required for the college, um, the fact that in many cases uh, the items for which bids will be invited have already been costed, even if those costs have to be adjusted for inflation. Uh, it should be a relatively speedy process, but nonetheless, it will certainly extend beyond the 27 months that we had hoped. Pam Cameron. Uh, Mr. Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister if he could outline the implications for his budget um, if welfare reform is not implemented within Northern Ireland? Uh, I think that becomes a very interesting question, Mr. Speaker. Members will be aware the Finance Minister has written to other ministers uh, the precise nature of what effects there might be on the Department of Justice, given that the Department of Justice budget is ring-fenced for this CSR period, are unclear to me. Mr. Cameron. Thank the Minister for his, his answer so far. Um, obviously, there would be concerns for um, 
community groups in particular who are, who are funded by the department so that they might be adversely affected and um, I would also have concerns about um, legal aid being paid out for the likes of non-molestation orders for women who have um, suffered domestic violence. Will those issues be ring fenced and protected? Well, Mr. Speaker, on the specific issue where we were able to ensure legal aid was paid for NMOs uh, without having to go through the full process, I regard that as one of the significant achievements that were made by this department in the early days of devolution. And I cannot imagine that's the kind of issue that would be reversed if there were budget cuts. Um, clearly, uh, there, are, there are major issues to be concerned as to how the budget would particularly apply. Um, we have to take account of the fact that both the formal ring fence status and the fact that additional funding was granted by the Treasury for security matters to the PSNI, both of those would have significant implications if there was to be any question of taking uh, cuts from the DOJ. Colin McCabot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, in light of the recent decision uh, by the MOD to withdraw from Bannockinner Armour Base, what discussions has he had with the MOD um, on the future of the base? None, Mr. Speaker. Colin McCabot. Uh, I'll take it then, Mr. Speaker, that my next question, that he has had any discussions uh, with particular reference to the many local employees currently employed at Bally Kindler? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the MOD's plans are for Bally Kindler. I mean, in addition to the accommodation, the current base of a battalion, there is also a significant training area, uh, which I understand may not be easily replicated elsewhere, and indeed, tra um, training area which is used by the PSNI as well as by the Army. So there are, there are longer term questions as to its precise use, which I have not yet heard the detail from the MOD, uh, but I have no specific responsibility for employment in South Down. Um, I do obviously have a concern about the provision of the tra training facility, which is currently used by the PSNI. Thank you, Mr. Mask. Mr. Mask. Can I ask the Minister, uh, could the Minister outline the process which allowed the Department to provide £380,000 to the Police Museum? Well, the position with, with regard to that was that there was £20 million, as members will know, allocated uh, to the, um, the PSNI part-time reserve, or the RUC and PSNI part-time reserve uh, uh, funding uh, as a recognition of the role carried out by reservists. After uh, payments were made and after all outstanding potential legal issues were cleared up and the administration was paid for, there remained a sum of £383,000 from that £20 million. Uh, there were discussions within, uh, between the department and a number of potential bodies which might have been in a position to spend that money. Uh, it was not possible to see it done by any other way than by uh, putting it forward for addition to the work uh, to be done on the police museum, which is also being funded separately by the Treasury as part of the devolution settlement. And that is why uh, the, the money remains there at the moment, awaiting, an out, awaiting a full business case for expenditure. Mr. Maskey. Thank you, Mr. I mean, I have to say I find that really unacceptable. In other words, the Minister is telling the House today that he has allocated a sum of £380,000 without a business case, without an idea what it may be used for. I mean, any other part of the department, any other part of the service under the Minister's jurisdiction could equally have said, yeah, I'll have that £330,000 ourselves and we'll work out later on what to do with it. I actually find that quite an appalling response from the Minister. So would the Minister like to comment on that? And is he seriously telling this House that there's no business case for this actually additional £380,000 which has just been given without the case being made? No, Mr. Speaker, I said that the money was being allocated towards the museum subject to a full business case which has to be put forward since the full business case for the museum has to be done. But the, but the, rea the reality was there were a the money was allocated specifically by the Treasury, earmarked for the part-time reserve fund. After the individual payments were made, this is the small outstanding sum which remains. It was not possible to find any alternative way of spending it uh, which would have gone to the benefit of individual members. Uh, because the potential bodies which might have been in a position to fund it felt that they were unable to do so. That is why the money has been allocated towards the museum, subject to the full bu uh, business case, and we await the outcome of that. The alternative, if Mr Maskey prefers, is I could return it to the Treasury. Paul Gerber. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in relation to uh, devolution of policing and justice in 2010, 
uh, I'm aware that the Minister is seeking legal opinion as to whether uh, he has the responsibility to deal with justice in relation to the OTRs. Uh, what is the outcome of that legal opinion? Mr Speaker, it's a, it's a pity that uh, Mr Gervin wasn't with his near namesake Mr Given uh, last Thursday afternoon. You'd nearly have thought sitting beside each other they'd have, you know, they'd have been better informed on this. Um, I, 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 for, I forget how many times I had to tell the Justice Committee uh, that in line with convention I was not going to declare the basis of legal advice. But, but, I, but I refer Mr Gervin to the Hansard which will shortly be available of last week's Justice Committee. Thank the Minister for not answering, uh, but uh, in relation to the, the, the point being made, uh, what action is going to be taken uh, in relation to the devolving of policing and justice from 2010 whenever 38 letters to OTRs were issued, uh, and is there any action that will be taken with the NIO in relation to issuing of those uh, whenever I believe it to be under the control and the jurisdiction of this Assembly and the Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I certainly don't believe that something which was never devolved to me is the responsibility of me or this Assembly. Um, I also fear, just to correct um, in a helpful way, uh, Mr Gervin, uh, that when he quotes the figure of 38, um, he clearly missed the correction by the Secretary of State, uh, where she had erroneously given figures to my colleague, the Member of Parliament for Belfast East. It's not 38, it's now 45. Um, that, um, it's, it's, it's even worse, and, and all the more reason why the issue needs to be followed up by the Select Committee of the House of Commons, which did such a good job last week in starting to expose some of the issues, because I believe that when you're inquiring into the work of the NIO, the Select Committee in the Commons is the place where it will best be done, that alongside the work of Lady Justice Hallett. Mia <coughs> McLaughlin. Here we Ken Corner, uh, if Clause 6 um, of the Human Trafficking Bill is brought into legislation, what will be the implications for equality obligations? Go ahead. Well, Mr Speaker, um, I think the question would have to be if Clause 6 is introduced, whether, you know, whether it was introduced unamended or amended, uh, but the equality obligations are, are not for me because it's not my bill, uh, but clearly there are those who believe that there would be significant equality questions to be answered. Um, I did last week spend some time uh, visiting Sweden to hear from effectively both sides of the debate there, uh, and also, as members will be aware, I have research commissioned to look into the nature and extent of prostitution in Northern Ireland to see what the implications might be for us, but at this stage I'm not in a position to answer the detail of the current version of Clause 6. And I thank the Minister for his reply, but can the Minister indicate whether he would see that there would be unintended consequences arising from Clause 6, and you know, if they would present his department then with challenges on implementing the legislation? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not sure that my department would have anything specific uh, to implement, though there would obviously be work uh, to be done by my arm's length bodies, particularly in the police. Uh, the issue for me is that we have commissioned research in the DOJ to ensure that there aren't any unintended consequences, that we are aware of what the situation is in Northern Ireland. Mr. McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the moment, um, drug testing in prisons is carried out in relation to prisoners, um, and the, the main capacity seems to be in relation uh, to illegal drugs as opposed to prescription drugs. And yet, it's said that 90% of all drugs uh, in prison uh, are prescription drugs. Do you say, Minister, can you say whether in fact the prison service has the capacity to deal with the real problem, which is the abuse of prescription drugs? Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. McGuinness raises a very significant point. Part of the difficulty is when you talk about abuse of prescription uh, drugs, um, individuals may have acquired inappropriately more of a particular drug than they are entitled to, but a testing may well just show that they have used it as opposed to that they have used excessive amounts of it. So there are complex issues around that. Uh, it's certainly at the moment, the, the issue is being looked at as to how um, tendering uh, 
uh, tendering is about to be uh, engaged in with the Scottish Prison Service to see what the best uh, drugs uh, options are for Northern Ireland, but it clearly is a difficult issue and is part of the ongoing work. That's why, for example, there's now much better intelligence-led uh, searching around drugs uh, rather than the random searching, which has produced some positive results. But I agree that the testing needs to be upgraded as well. I thank the Minister for his answer, and in view of his answer, if it is found that the Scottish uh, firm that is dealing with these matters is not adequately dealing with the overall situation as I have described it, will an alternative be uh, sought out? Well, I take Mr McGuinness's point, Mr Speaker. I think the key issue is to ensure that when the new contract is tendered for later this year, that we will ensure that we get the right cover. But I say there are particular difficulties about testing for what are otherwise legal drugs. Order, members, that concludes question time.